I'm going to talk to you about a third report that I think is quite relevant to the other two. Um, and this is one that the World Bank commissioned, turn down the heat, a four degree warmer world must be avoided. And it was commissioned by the World Bank of the Potsdam Institute. Uh, and I'd like to talk about that, but also kind of move the conversation into the realm of thinking as well about adaptation. But just to start, I want to remind us that um, where the world is today, Robert, you might have to just stay up here. Joe, you were nothing by comparison. I'm still ahead. Can I just uh, am I just <laughs> a lot of That's so gracious. Yes. Okay. Yes. I wanted to remind us that where we're starting from is an unsustainable world today, a world where still more than a billion people do not have access to clean water or to modern electricity. But the climate change world of tomorrow is going to exacerbate these problems, these inequities, because as we've heard, most of the uh, impacts will be negative, and they will be especially so for the poorest and most vulnerable. Virtually every sector in every region will be challenged. Our institutions are ill-equipped to cope with this kind of massive change in all regions and all sectors. And so we need both mitigation, as we've heard very dramatically, very strongly now, but we equally importantly need to get on with the big adaptation uh, role because it's already too late to avoid significant climate change. What we're seeing at point zero, 0 0.8 degrees C is very significant. And if we wait, most adaptation measures will be more costly and less effective as the magnitude increases. So we really are in a crisis situation. We've lost at least a decade or two in doing serious mitigation or serious adaptation. So this is the cover of the report, Turn Down the Heat, and let me take you through some of the messages. The first three are very similar to what you've heard that business as usual will have us on that red line, which is roughly uh, more than three degrees by 2100. The world's commitments to date, now shown as a yellow-orange line, will certainly take us beyond two degrees, and there's a 50% chance that it would take us beyond three. But as you've heard, everything that could be done isn't being done and hasn't been committed to. And so you've seen lines like the blue one that you're seeing there, the IPCC low emission scenario. This is not a new message to the scientists who have been studying this for 20 years. And sometimes, though, I think it's really important to bring new messengers to bring this message. And I think that's what actually happened. Uh, the new World Bank president, Jim Kim, as you know, is the first scientist to help uh, to hold the World Bank presidency. And after reviewing this PIC report and talking to many climate scientists, he said he is convinced that climate change will make achieving the mission of the bank, alleviating poverty, much, much harder. And in fact, it might be impossible at a four degree world. And so I think this is very important and he saw quite a bit of media coverage. So what did the report conclude? In brief, it said there's a more than 20% risk that we will exceed four degrees by 2100. And again, that the poor will be the most affected that temperatures will be more pronounced over different regions of the globe, but at some places, you could be reaching close to physiological limits for people and for livestock. We've learned from this report that the coolest temperatures in the tropics in the 2100 years will be warmer than the warmest temperatures now. And there's a fair amount in this report about extremes, since of course those are what cause human pain and suffering. And so, for example, the heat wave in Russia of 2010, that is likely to become the new normal summer as you go forward. Ocean acidification is going to rise to levels not known on Earth's history, and these geophysical impacts will have very human impacts, societal and ecosystem uh, impacts. Small island states are going to be especially vulnerable to flooding. Water scarcity will be amplified, particularly in Africa and in Asia. There will be a significant risk for food security in India, in Africa, and also, though, in the US and in Australia. Regional impacts on corals will affect community fisheries and tourism, and large-scale biodiversity loss and concomitant reduction in ecosystem services. So the conclusions are uh, there's no certainty 
that adaptation to a foreign degree world is, in fact, possible. But as we've heard from the previous reports, a warming of four degrees can still be avoided. The report also has, and I recognize this is a very messy slide, but it has some very interesting new science of the statistic connection between some of the extreme climate events and the probability that they are actually linked to anthropogenic climate change. So for example, the 2003 heat wave in Europe, the 2011 uh, US heat and drought conditions, there's high confidence that we're seeing a climate signal in that, not so much as you see in Pakistan. And you might want to look at this table, which is table one in the full report. The numbers next to it refer to the references. Um, we also discuss how exceptional ecosystems uh, and our efforts to preserve them are likely not to succeed. And exceptional ecosystems are things that we consider irreplaceable or very distinctive, and these are the places where conservation efforts are currently being focused. So there's 187 of these, and 147 of these are already threatened from other stresses like habitat fragmentation, invasive species, or pollution. And the brownest colors that you're seeing on these maps are where the average temperature will be more than, for more than 10 months, hotter than the hottest temperatures now. And this is under three different models. But what you can see is that the Amazon and Sub-Saharan Africa look particularly bleak. In terms of drought, this map is showing you that the average drought risk at three degrees C will be severe to extreme for all the areas that are covered, colored red and purple. And so you see that extreme drought is becoming more of the norm. There's quite a bit on sea level rise, and in particular, the study tries to refine some of the regional estimates of the land-based ice and how that will affect different areas. But basically, the conclusion reinforces the message we know, that is that sea level, the rate of sea level rise is increasing, and that storm surge and sea level rise are far greater concerns for most of the poor of the world, as this picture of Bangladesh demonstrates. Well, we, we tend as a group to um, study impacts kind of sector by sector, but we really need to begin to think about, as you've heard, system interactions, systems responses, and nonlinearity. And here is where my true lack of computer skills will come to bear. My PowerPoint on my computer shows this very dramatic exchange, this tiny little uh, domino spinning and knocking over this giant domino and making a big splash and giving you an example of cascading or tipping points. So please use your imagination because it does not work on this computer. But the idea is, of course, that the, the climate change could be the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. And we have seen how these things can happen. So for example, a drought not particularly of record coinciding with only a one degree C temperature increase in the Rockies led to a massive invasion, a pest invasion, and millions of hectares of dead trees. And that was the example of multiple stresses cascading tipping points. That same scenario with trees, though, has been replicated many times across the globe. And we're seeing very clearly in the last few decades of our droughts and our floods and our heat waves how linked globally we all are and how crop failures in one place cascade and interact with floods or droughts in other places and can amplify all the impacts. So the future, we definitely must avoid the unmanageable and manage the unavoidable. Mitigation to avoid getting into the unmanageable realm, but adaptation to manage that which we cannot avoid. And I would say it's finally time that adaptation is no longer a forbidden word. It instead embodies resilience, preparedness, and robustness to climate change. However, this is a very nascent field. Uh, we have a rich research and management agenda to attack. We've hardly begun. But we need to think about response strategies that will work on the composite of multiple stresses of which climate is one. We need to think about infrastructure that will withstand the new extremes, not the old 100-year flood of yore. We need to think about seed varieties that don't perform optimally in today's climate, but can actually perform well in droughts and floods and heats. We may need to think about prioritizing land and species to preserve. And as we do that, we're going to need to think about co-benefits 
And of course, to protect people, we're going to have to have emergency response plans, early warning systems, develop social safety nets, and the role of insurance, which right now is very much a developed world thing, will have to be thought about. It's 3% of global GDP, but that's almost all in the rich world. And because we are adapting adaptively, we all have to learn by doing and sharing best practices. Um, one example, uh, this is a huge agenda that we definitely need to get on with, and I would argue neither domestically nor internationally has it been uh, really tackled seriously. One example that I wanted to mention as we think about uh, multiple stressors and ways, for example, to preserve natural capital and ecosystem-based management, something that Jeff is very much interested in, there could be big win-win. So for example, this is the Los Plateau of China, which is an area about the size of France. And it was rehabilitated, and there have been multiple benefits. Decreased frequency of floods and landslides, much better environmental conditions, both locally and extending many, even thousands of miles away. So I think we need to look for many more of these natural capital wins. I like to think of adaptation as sort of a, a five-part circle, and, and this is a diagram from the, uh, the National Climate Assessment of the U.S., which is out for review, so that's why the U.S. map is in the middle of the circle. But I would argue, as we looked at adaptation, most efforts that are underway are really thinking what's vulnerable. They've barely gotten to the what can we do about it, what kind of planning, what are policy options, very little about actually implementing things, nothing about monitoring, evaluating whether they're working, and then sharing of best practices and feeding back into that cycle. And so I'd say we're very much at the beginning there. And the Jeff, of course, has implemented 117 adaptation projects. So I would say they're further down on this circle, down to the third part. But the monitoring evaluation and the revision of strategy and sharing of best practices, I think, is a huge task for everyone to undertake. So in conclusion, I think we need to build climate change adaptation into all of our natural resources and our infrastructure planning and management, both in the developing and in the developed countries, in order to assure that all of the areas on the world, on this world map that are still dark, get a sustainable future. And that requires that we turn down the heat and ramp up adaptation. Both mitigation and adaptation must be co-equal as we combat climate change and lift people out of poverty. Thank you very much.